Okay, so welcome to AIM Research. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. This is our second session of the year, and we have a fantastic set of speakers in the months ahead. I hope you'll go check them out. This event is hosted by the Center for Academic Innovation and aims to act as a center for conversation, inspiration, and research to inform educational innovation of all kinds. If you have ideas for people we should be inviting to come join us, please do send them my way. I even hear rumors that maybe we get to invite these folks back uh, next year to hear more about their research, because so, it sounds like there's amazing things emerging. I'm going to throw the URL of Academic Innovation's event in the chat. I encourage people to go check those out. So today I am thrilled for us to be hearing from Wesley Weimer, Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, College of Engineering, and Madeline Endress, PhD candidate in Computer Science and Engineering, to talk about their work to read or to rotate, comparing the effects of technical reading training and spatial skills training on novice programming ability. Wes and Maddie, the stage is yours. Excellent. And I'm, I'm hoping this will be a, a fun talk. And since there are, you know, a, a smaller number of people here, you should really uh, just feel comfortable to, uh, you know, speak out or, or sort of raise your hand in Zoom at any point. I'm going to say a, a few things at the beginning for the first slide or two, but then very quickly toss things over to uh, Maddie, uh, who really led the effort on this. So as mentioned, this is about to read or to rotate comparing the effects of technical reading training and spatial skills training. What do those mean? More in just a minute on novice programming ability. But there were three high level points I wanted to mention for why this talk might be interesting to this audience uh, right at the beginning. And uh, one of the first, Maddie, if I could trouble you to move to the next slide, uh, perhaps almost the least interesting is that it has led to effective, approachable science. It led to two accepted peer review publications at top software engineering venues, but uh, those also involved undergraduate researcher participants, uh, one of whom is a paper co-author and a number of whom were involved in, in running the sessions and helping us to collect uh, human subjects data. So we're gonna be talking briefly about uh, each of these two projects, one that was more of a, a longitudinal observational study of, of test or behavioral outcomes in a class, and the other that involved brain scans, which I like quite a bit. <clears throat> On the next slide, though, one of the other things that I, I think might make this work interesting to this audience is that it features collaboration from many institutional areas. For the work itself, it's joint between computer science and psychology. And so unable to join us today, but uh, Dr. Preeti Shah helped out with the uh, longitudinal sort of behavioral aspects and Dr. Yulia Kovalman and her team helped out with the uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy, the medical imaging part on the research. And we're really excited to see, uh, you know, engineering and uh, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences work together in that regard. But it was also to some degree, uh, supported at the, the institutional level, both by the Center for Academic Innovation, but also by former Dean Joanna Milinchik uh, for resources and consultation support. And although we may be, uh, you know, speaking to people who already know this, uh, I found the consultations talking to people at Center for Academic Innovation about, you know, what, what we should be doing uh, to be really helpful. But this is also a project that builds on ideas even farther afield in Michigan. And you're gonna hear us talk a bit about spatial ability and spatial training. And we um, helped, or we, we were helped by leveraging ideas from Cheryl Sorby at Michigan Technological University, a bit uh, farther north. And so some of the ideas that we're gonna be talking about here were, were perhaps pioneered in schools where students might've come in with uh, less preparation or with different backgrounds. We wanna see, can we adopt that, uh, you know, or find the best parts of those for Ann Arbor. The last part about this that I want to mention that I think is really cool is that it involves, a, um, I mean, well, from our perspective, a longitudinal classroom integration. We studied uh, dozens of CS101 students over 11 weeks. And I'll just say that on a, a personal note, as a researcher from the educator side, can often feel difficult to do controlled classroom experiments. If you feel like you have a, a good idea for an intervention that would help, can be really hard to not give the control group uh, that idea or that support. And so I think we had a, a decent approach here to resolving that, where both the control and the treatment group received some amount of support, and Maddie may explain that uh, in a bit. In general, though, we're going to be talking about work to try to help novice student programmers, introductory class uh, student programmers to help make novices more like experts uh, with the most support we can. And at this point, I want to turn things over to Maddie to explain what we're going to be investigating. Thanks, Wes. 
Okay, and I want to reiterate, feel free to interrupt at any time if you have any questions, uh, that's totally fine. Okay, so at a high level, our work is motivated by the fact that novice programmers really often struggle. Uh, for many aspiring software engineers, successfully completing a first computer science course, or CS1, is an essential step towards a first uh, a CS focused career. However, introductory programming courses often suffer from high rates of attrition, as I'm sure many of you know, and also less affluent students or students with weaker preparatory education can struggle disproportionately. This is a situation that may contribute to the lack of diversity that's endemic in many modern software workplaces. One reason uh, underserved students may struggle in computing is a lack of preparation and cognitive skills that are helpful for programming. So one example of such a cognitive skill is spatial reasoning, which is the ability to mentally manipulate 3D and 2D objects. And I'm gonna talk a bit, a bit more about spatial reasoning later in this talk, but for now, it's just important to know that spatial reasoning ability is correlated with both socioeconomic status and computing success. So this is just an example of a skill that might be both correlated with background, but then also the ability to succeed in computing. And there's more than just that as well. So the question is, how can we help students with insufficient preparation in these general cognitive skills still succeed in computing? So one potential way to help these underprepared students is using cognitive interventions. So the basic idea behind these interventions is that students are given supplemental instruction in a cognitive skill that might they might struggle with. The hope then is that this will transfer to more general success. This cognitive intervention approach has been pretty successful in other fields. For example, this is just some of many different examples, but this is a study that shows that biology student confidence and scientific communication ability was increased through a writing training course. We have a bunch of studies that are looking specifically at spatial visualization, and it's been found to help improve things from middle school students' math ability to chemistry students' understanding of molecular structure. And then, in fact, spatial reasoning instruction has been found to improve outcomes generally in science and engineering, and this is some work that was done by uh, Cheryl Sorby, who Wes mentioned earlier. Uh, which is really cool work. I highly recommend checking out this paper if you, if you haven't seen it. So cognitive interventions can be helpful to support struggling students in fields other than computer science. Um, and as a result, they may also help improve outcomes for introductory programming courses. But there's still a big question, like what cognitive interventions may be helpful for programming? It's probably not just one, there's probably multiple. Which one should we do? What sort of skills should we target? So in this paper, we help answer this question. So actually in this paper, I may be talking about two different papers. This first part is the paper that we're gonna be talking about these interventions, and then I'll go more into the medical imaging side later, but we're gonna be comparing the effectiveness of two different training interventions on programming performance. That is, we recruited a bunch of students just starting CS1 who had never programmed before. And then while they were taking CS1, we had them also take one of two cognitive skill courses that we were teaching. We had courses for two skills that were both associated with programming through medical imaging studies. And the goal was to see which one, if either, might help students more. Um, the two skills that we picked were spatial reasoning ability and technical reading ability. The goal then was that at the end of the semester, we see if the participants in one performed better in programming than the other. Okay, so with our high level plan in mind, let's now talk about these two interventions in more detail. After that, I'll explain our experimental design and findings regarding these interventions. And then I will continue on to talk about the second paper after that. Okay. So as I said, in this paper, we compare the effects of spatial reasoning and technical reading training on novice programming ability. Um, so to enable experimentally comparing these two interventions, both courses were structured to take the same amount of time and were taught with the same set of teachers. Let's now take a look at these two courses in more detail. So for the spatial reasoning training, um, as I mentioned earlier, spatial reasoning is the ability to mentally manipulate 2D and 3D objects. It has been connected to computer science by medical imaging results, and then also from a whole boat of correlatory and some limited causal evidence from the computer science education literature. Um, for our spatial reasoning training in this experiment, we use a validated curriculum that was developed by Cheryl Sorby at Michigan Tech, as Wes mentioned earlier. And this course is commonly used to teach spatial reasoning ability to engineering departments and consists of things like you're practicing sketching different shapes from different angles or visualizing rotations and those sorts of things. 
Now, while spatial training curriculums and interventions are common in engineering, technical reading interventions are definitely less so. So for this one, we actually developed our own intervention to teach strategies for efficiently and effectively understanding scientific writing. These strategies focused on using structural cues to quickly and accurately scan texts to retrieve and understand key points. For example, we taught participants how to use outlines when reading to improve comprehension and how to understand figures and charts in scientific writing and how to understand persuasive technical proposals. This focus on structure was motivated by findings from the eye tracking community um, in computer science that has found that experienced programmers tend to read code non-linearly, focusing on a high level feature. So we're trying to like a connection between how you might scan through scientific writing to pull the key points to how you might scan through uh, a program. To encourage transfer to programming ability, we use computer science related scientific research papers as, as example texts, but these weren't papers that had like programming instruction in them. They were more like meta reviews, like how to be a good manager of software engineers or things like that. Okay, so having talked a bit about the contents of our two interventions, how did we compare their effectiveness in a controlled manner? So here's an overall timeline of our experiment, which took place over the course of a semester. This timeline started with recruiting participants from an introductory computer science course in week three of the semester. From this CS1 course, we deliberately recruited participants who did not have incoming computer science experience. Okay, so we have these participants who are taking CS1, and then once we've recruited them, we divided them randomly into two groups. Um, so originally we had 50 people in each group, but this actually coincided with COVID semester. It's a whole host of things, asking about it in the questions after. But in the end, we ended up having about 30 people in each group who completed the whole study. And then we had one of these groups was for spatial reasoning training and one was for the technical reading training. Both groups had no incoming preparation and we validated this by comparing performance of the two groups on an initial programming exam of which both groups performed equally poorly, like, like at random basically on, the, on this initial coming exam. And for both trainings, participants attended a weekly two hour supplemental meeting for nine different weeks. The goal here is to see which cognitive training course more helped people with programming, and uh, we compare these two interventions against each other rather than against a no treatment group for a couple of reasons. First of all, the spatial training is already validated, making it a pretty strong baseline. And then also, pragmatically, uh, participants drop out of studies if they can tell that a group is like the no treatment intervention. If we had everyone coming in and they were doing crosswords for like nine weeks, they might be like, this is, this is, not, this is not worth my time. So we wanted two things that could help people regardless of which group they were in potentially. So with our experimental setup in mind, the question is now, which group did better on our final sort of programming assessment? Those in the spatial training or those in the technical reading training? Okay, so we found that participants in our technical reading training intervention performed better on the final programming exam than those in the standardized spatial reasoning intervention. This difference is um, and helpfulness between the two groups was significant with P equals 0 0.02. In a statistical sense, it was a small to medium effect. So it wasn't a huge effect, um, but it was still substantial. Um, it does mark an improvement over a state of the art spatial training curricula. So it may still be that the spatial training curricula helped just at least in our particular case here, we saw greater improvement in the reading training. This result provides evidence that technical reading ability may transfer to programming ability, and that in some cases, it may actually be more helpful for programming ability than spatial reasoning ability. Obviously, this is just one first result, but we think it's very cool. But now that we know this overall result of our reading training, we also want to know like what programming skills did this most impact? So to help answer this question, the final programming assessment that we used had three types of questions. Um, it was a validated assessment that was previously divided into these question types. These were code completion questions, definitional questions, and then code tracing questions. And we then wanted to look at the programming gains for each of these three question types individually. And what we would expect is we would expect to see the gains to be biggest in the code tracing questions because that's what our reading training was specifically designed to do. And in fact, that is exactly what we see. Um, while the reading training, the raw number was higher for all three of these, it was only significant for the code tracing questions. Participants in the reading group significantly improved on code tracing questions compared to those in the spatial group with P equals 0 
In our reading training, we focused on teaching strategies for using structural cues, like I mentioned, to trace through and understand scientific papers. So this result indicates that this focus on structure can transfer from prose to code, corroborating results from eye tracking community in CS that found that experienced programmers tend to read code non-linearly and focusing on high level features. So I think this is really cool. It's an example of like having a hypothesis based on result and seeing, wow, that's what we found. That's really cool. So I thought this was pretty cool. So in summary, in this paper, we compared the effects of two cognitive interventions on CS1 programming performance, spatial reasoning training, and our novel CS-focused technical reading training. While doing so, we found that our technical reading training helped programming ability more, especially helping novices trace through code. These results have implications for introductory software engineering curricula, but as our chosen cognitive interventions were both motivated by work using medical imaging, they also demonstrate that the results of medical imaging studies and software engineering can lead to improved programming outcomes. So on that note, I've been mentioning this medical imaging thing a lot, um, that medical imaging can help inform these sorts of interventions. But what does this mean and what does it look like? So I showed you all this experimental timeline earlier in this talk. It said that for the intervention study, we recruited participants in week two and then gave them some initial written pretests in week four before the intervention started. Well, it turns out that when while giving these written pretests, we also gave a subset of our participants brain scans while programming to better understand the cognitive processes of their work. And so with that, it's time to talk about our second paper, which was Relating Reading, Visualization, and Coding for New Programmers, a Neuroimaging Study. And to start, what does giving brain, screen, brain scans while programming mean, and why does it even matter? Okay, so to answer these questions, let's first establish the motivation for using medical imaging to study programming. In general, understanding the cognitive basis for software engineering is important because it can help us understand the cause of observed effects and from this implement more effective policies and tools. To some extent, understanding the cognitive basis of programming can help inform pedagogical interventions like the one I talked about in the first half of this talk. Neuroimaging is one form of medical imaging and it's a particularly appealing way to study program comprehension because unlike subjective self-reporting, it allows us to objectively measure at least the cognitive activity. Obviously, you're not going to be able to interpreting those results is still uh, is still very challenging, but it's at least another lens rather than what someone is just saying, like how they felt or how they were particularly seeing something. Both are important, but they give different lenses. So neuroimaging is a fairly new methodology for studying programming. Um, I think like the first like fMRI one was only something like 10, 10 years ago, maybe less, probably less. Wes can, Wes can tell you that for sure. But it has potential impacts in areas that include pedagogy and technology transfer. This is why we decided to combine it with the intervention study I talked about earlier. So we use neuroimaging to answer the following two research questions. First, we want to know, do novices rely more on spatial language brain regions while programming? Um, or sorry, on spatial or language brain regions while programming. So these are like the two interventions that we talked about earlier. And then we also wanna know how do these novices compare to experts? Second, we want to know if we can use brain activation patterns at the beginning of CS1 to predict future programming ability. And the second one, the goal isn't to be like, oh, you can be a good programmer and then you can be a bad programmer. No, the goal is to be like, maybe these are students who might struggle some more. And so maybe you want to give them additional support, things like that. Okay, so how do we do the brain scans themselves? Well, the way that we did it was by using functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is definitely a mouthful, but we can also just say FNIRS for short. And it uses light transmitters and receivers and a special cap to measure the brain's blood oxygen levels. It supports studying the brain while programming in a natural environment. So you can just be like basically sitting at a desk. You can't move too much, but you can just be sitting there and typing and we can get um, some brain activation information from that. During the scans, we compared brain activity while participants completed three different tasks. This was a CS1 level programming task, a spatial visualization task, and a reading related task. The spatial and reading tasks match those used in our two interventions. Each participant scan session, including setup, lasted about two hours. And as a visual of the study environment, here's my excellent undergrad researcher, Annie, who is wearing an FNIRS cap during a pilot scan. All participants were shown 90 stimuli, 30 of each type. We had 31 valid participants, 24 of whom were female. 
To analyze the data, we used best practices from psychology literature that were, we were helped with with our wonderful psychology collaborators and to compare task-based activation by brain area. Okay, so for our question, do novices rely more on spatial language areas, spatial or language areas while programming? And this is definitely a very informal way of putting it, but it's a first sort of way to get at this sort of idea. If you want to have more, more details, there's definitely more in the paper or ask me more at the end of this talk. But generally and very informally, we found that the answer is that novices rely more on spatial areas rather than language areas. Specifically, we find more substantial differences between coding and reading, the between coding and mental rotation. So to help visualize this finding, here are some color-coded heat maps that highlight relative brain regions with coding versus reading on the left and coding versus mental rotation on the right. Now, right now, I can't talk about these in super depth. Uh, some of you may have seen them before, but if you've not, definitely ask me about them after the presentation. I can go through them in more detail um, and the like. But in general, more colored dots mean that there are more significant differences and that there are more dots in the left picture between coding and reading than in the right picture between coding and mental rotation. And we can particularly see this in the right hemisphere where um, the left image, there's a lot more like red dots than you would see in the other side and in the frontal cortex. Now, even though programming for novices seems more similar to spatial visualization than reading, we do find that coding is distinct from both of them. In particular, we find that for novices, coding is cognitively demanding as we see stronger working memory activation than for either other task. Okay, so we found that for novices, programming looks more like spatial visualization than like reading. Great, but why do we care? To answer this question, we'll need to put our results into context with previous research that indicates that with greater expertise, programming looks more like reading in the brain. Now this work that I'm talking about, this previous work, wasn't working with novices. All of their participants were at least third or fourth year programming um, students. However, our results indicate that the pattern observed by previous research continues. For the least experienced programmers, programming and reading are really quite distinct. Now, how do these results align with our findings regarding cognitive interventions for CS1? Well, in learning theory, spatial reasoning is sometimes viewed as a general problem-solving toolbox. Thus, the observed conversion of, problem, of programming and reading through expertise may be caused by programmers learning domain-specific strategies that can be more reading-associative cognitive processes. This is definitely just a hypothesis, but it's something that I find potentially compelling. If this is true, directly training reading-based domain-specific strategies may help novices become expert fasters. Well, is this the case? Well, in the research I talked about in the first half of this presentation, we found the answer is yes, that training technical reading strategies did indeed help novices who are programming uh, get better faster. So to summarize research question one, we found that for novices, spatial reasoning is more similar to programming than reading at a cognitive level. This is in contrast to results with expert developers and has implications for future programming trainings and interventions like the ones that I mentioned at the first part of this talk. So moving on to research question two, can brain activation patterns captured at the start of CS1 predict future programming ability? To answer this question, we conduct an exploratory study where we correlate brain activations um, on the three tasks with scores on the programming post-test. Doing so, we find that yes, it is possible to use brain scans to predict performance. Specifically, we find that less similar patterns of activation for coding and mental rotation in the right frontal hemisphere at the start of semester predict better outcomes on the end of semester programming assessment. Oh, and this was a medium sized correlation of 0 point, or negative 0 0.48. Okay, so this analysis is exploratory, so we can't yet say why these less similar patterns of activation predict better performance. One possibility that aligns with the implications discussed with research question one is that novices who transition earlier away from general spatial skills to reading associated domain specific strategies might ultimately make more progress. Uh, but this is definitely a, a hypothesis that has not been tested. Someone should totally do that. It would be really cool, but cannot say either way on this one. Um, but it does provide an impetus for potentially earlier pedagogical uh, interventions in computer science. Finally, I want to be really clear that we do not see this result as supporting essentialist-based theories of programming ability. Rather, we think it provides insight for more effectively understanding and removing computing barriers 
However, if you want to talk more about the ethical considerations behind using medical imaging to predict performance, definitely ask during the discussion. So in summary of research question two, we found that yes, novice brain activity while programming can predict future programming ability. This finding provides another window into understanding and ameliorating computing barriers. So as a summary of the second paper, we conducted a study of 31 novice programmers where we found that programming is a challenging working memory intensive task. We also found that spatial reasoning is quote unquote, more similar to programming than reading for novices and that programming brain activity can predict future programming ability weeks later. And now that I've talked about both of these studies, let's quickly summarize the both of them and open up for questions. So in summary, in the first study I talked about, we found out that technical reading training can transfer to improved programming ability, a result that could help with CS1 instruction. And in the second study, I talked about our work using medical imaging to understand the cognitive basis of programming for those same novice programmers. We found that in contrast with experts, for novices, spatial reasoning is more similar to programming than reading at a cognitive level and Taken together, these results indicate that perhaps reading-focused training could help novices become experts faster. Now, of course, these are just two studies and much more work and replication is needed, but taken together, I find this work exciting and hope that future research can continue to build on these results. So definitely ask me questions. I have some potential questions on the slide here, but any other questions are also totally welcome. Thanks. That was wonderful. Thank you so much.